Well, good afternoon, everyone. I will go ahead and get started so we can keep this on time. Um, welcome to the second in our series of webinars. Um, we're very happy to have you joined. I'm Kelly Myers. I'm the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big River LCC coordinator, and um, this is kind of uh, the second in a series of webinars that we've been hosting on issues that we hope are important to um, all of you out there. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Abby so she can introduce the speakers. And again, thank you for participating with us today. Thanks, Kelly. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone on the phone, this is being recorded and we'll post um, the webinars on our website. And the past two webinars have already been posted um, on the ETPBR LCC website. Um, and if you could also remember to mute your phones uh, so we don't get any weird background noise. Uh, our, second, our second presentation today is going to be Lisa Schulte-Moore with Iowa State and her first project. But first, we have Diane Larson with USCIS. Um, she's going to be talking about our Prairie Database. So if you want to take it over, Diane. Okay, thank you. Um, can everybody see the screen just to make sure before I start? You're good. Okay, thanks. So um, the title of the presentation is Can We Improve Prairie Reconstruction Methods by Record Keeping? Now that's really not the most exciting title you've probably ever seen, but I think it's pretty um, it's, it's really what we're going after is how can we keep good records that will result in prairie reconstruction. So the title is actually um, reflective of what I'm going to try to bring across today. A lot of people were involved in this study and I want to make sure that everyone acknowledged and that's why at, there's all, this, um, all these people listed on the first page of the presentation. So Marissa Allering at the Nature Conservancy and Becky Esser with Fish and Wildlife Service, um, Pauline Drobny, Karen Dufty Sparkman, all with Fish and Wildlife Service, and Jen Larson. Those are the people involved in the conceptualization and the initial um, get this, this study off the ground and getting the funding. Um, Jen also did all of the GIS work, and that was a considerable project in and of itself. Uh, our field crew, Amanda McCulpin, Ian Drobny, Saskia Rather, and Drew Lowe, they're the ones who went out and evaluated all of these um, study sites that I'm going to be talking about. And then there was a lot of databasing that had to go on to get all of the historic reconstruction methods in, into a database that we could use. And Amanda McCulpin, Tamlia Turner, Kathy Carlisle, and Ben Walker did that. The goal, of course, is to improve the practice of prairie reconstruction. And to do that, we wanted to have criteria by which we could measure success. What is a successful prairie reconstruction? And we wanted to relate those criteria to planting and management actions so that we could improve those actions to make better reconstruction in the long run. Um, we also are working with database developers, that's um, Chicago Botanics, garden to make this assessment compatible with data that is going into a larger database, which some of you are already aware of. Uh, the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative has taken this on as one of their major projects. And um, so all of the data that I'm talking about today will go into this bigger database, and all of you can also contribute to that database. And then we want to provide SOPs, ultimately, for how to monitor all of these um, reconstruction so that in the end, we all collect similar kinds of data and that will simplify analyses down the road and we can learn even more. Our two um, study regions were um, Glacial Ridge National Wildlife Refuge and Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. What this, this picture is showing you really is these little dots of reconstructed prairie in this huge area, all that brown sort of beige area, that was pre-settlement extent of tall grass prairie. So we're talking about very small bits, but they're important bits and they're what we're learning from right now. So that's the important thing is that these places have, have been 
their goal really has been to reconstruct prairie into um, ecosystems again. So our study site, Glacial Ridge, was established by the Nature Conservancy in 2000 and then transferred to the Fish and Wildlife Service in 2004. Um, it's mainly gra sandy, gravelly beach ridges. It was on the edge of Glacial Lake Agassiz, and it's separated. These ridges are separated by um, finer sand, silts, and clay, which are in wet areas. It was initially established to connect by reconstruction some remnant prairies that were still in existence on this area. It all had been drained and farmed, and, and so they've, they've taken this land and, and brought it back into prairie vegetation. And Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1990. It's a silty clay loam with interconnected swales and hill slopes. Its, it's total reason for being is to reconstruct prairies from farmland. So prairies, not just prairies, but I think they have a, a larger mandate even to, to think about um, uh, the larger landscape. So, so those were the two main study sites that we're working with. Our methods included um, only looking at those management units that were constructed between 2002 and 2012. We didn't want to have anything that was just done in the year we were out there because that isn't really reflective of what the reconstruction might turn into. So this gave us a, a reasonable time frame. Um, the known, we wanted to only use those prairies that had known seeding and management histories so that we would have all the data we needed to try to evaluate those um, histories. And we wanted to include wet music and dry prairies um, that so we could tell if one was particularly difficult or easier for reconstruction. So each prairie polygon that we surveyed at Glacial Ridge was an independent, um, an independent study area. And what this is showing you is just the mosaic of wet music and dry prairies. And then within each of these, um, these black lines, that would be a a management unit, and we would pick one prairie that we could survey within each of those management units. At Neil Smith, somewhat the same idea, except that we had multiple um, prairies within a single management unit. So what that meant was that we had a nested design, and that um, because in those gray areas that you see, the, um, the prairies in this, like inside this gray area here, these prairies of dry music and wet were all seeded at the same time and with the same seed mixes. So we had to take that into account when we were analyzing the data. Our field sampling occurred June through September 2015. Um, prior to the sampling, Jen plotted the transects across the elevation gra gradient. Uh, we had 10 plots on each transect so that we had um, the same sample effort for some of the metrics we were calculating across all of our study polygons. We also had a time constrained botanist directed walk, which allowed the, the field crew to go out and try to find all the species. We really wanted to know if what was planted had come up, and you can't ever get all of that information from one sort of sample method. For the analysis, we had um, several response variables, and these were, were, were actually kind of trying to evaluate which of these worked well. What we really want to do is, is have a few main variables that people can focus on in the future. So we looked at the frequency of the planted and the non-native species, the proportion of planted species that established and were persisting to the time that we sampled, and then the species richness, diversity, and evenness. I'm not going to talk so much about that today. Um, and then the mean coefficient of conservatism. And I, I think most of you are probably familiar with that. Um, that's, that's basically, um, we got it from the um, universal FQA calculator, which I've put the, the um, 
a URL where you can look at that. And they have databases of, of the, the C value for all the different species. And we just calculated the mean from that. There were two analyses that we did, and the first was really just to visualize what the species looked like. What, what was our pattern of species um, in the seed mixture as well as in the surveyed species? And then it was a non-metric multidimensional scaling, which is a, um, it's a multivariate technique that allows us to really look at the patterns in species occurrence. And I'll show you, I'll explain it more when we see the pictures. But then we can overlay different variables to see how, how they correspond to how the species collectively looked on the landscape. And then we did the usual mixed model ANOVA. Uh, we had management unit um, as a single prairie type at glacial ridge. That was a very simple analysis. And then we had a split plot at Neil Smith because of that. Uh, grouping of prey types within management units. So this is the non-metric multidimensional scaling. And what, what this is showing you, this is the, the mix of species that were seeded on this, this one. And then those that we surveyed is on the right. So what, what the blue dots are are the species. And access, what, the, what, this, what this method does is sort of tell you how much variation you can account for in the species. And what this is, axis, between axis one and axis two, we accounted for over 80% variation in the seeded species. Then look at this prairie type, dry, music, and wet. And you can see the dry is this, this red area. And what this envelope is telling you is this just connecting the outliers of that particular um, where those species were seeded. So these are all the names of different, different sites. DC3 is a site. And so sites that are closer together had more similar seeding um, species seeded. So these, these two, DC7 and DC11, are very similar in the, not the seeds that were placed there. And also, DC7 is also more similar to music um, site than to, say, this other DC, this other dry site up here. So the closer the, the sites are to each other, the more similar was the mix that was seeded there. So what this basically is showing you is that there was a lot of similarity in the seed mixes. They didn't segregate very much with respect to um, what they put on a dry prairie versus what they put on a music prairie versus what they put on a wet prairie. So there's a lot of similarity in the seed mix. But we see that richness was very strongly associated with axis one. So the higher richness um, seed mixes were all over to the left. But each, ty each type of prairie, each prairie site, sorry, each dry music or wet all got some of that rich seed mix and all got some of that low diversity seed mix. But then when you get out to what we found, again, looking at dry music and wet, and remembering that the, the sites that are closest to each other had the most similarity of, of species, um, you really don't see, again, a big difference. Um, but you do see that the drives are sort of segregated over here. But there's a lot of overlap. So again, it's not very different from what, the way it was seeded we still got a lot of similarity. But what's really interesting is that the only variable that was really correlated with an axis was age. So as the prairies were getting was were maturing, we had some change in our species composition in this direction. Now looking at um, Neil Smith. They only had three dry prairies, so there, that really wasn't much to go on. But again, there was a lot of overlap. You have a, an outlier here, uh, which had a very different seed mix than all the rest. But in general, there wasn't a lot of difference. And again, richness was the primary driver of axis one. 
this, I think this one accounted for, again, close to 80% of the variation. So um, it, it, it's fairly uh, inclusive of what was out there. Then looking at uh, the surveyed species, they separated a bit. We have a lot more outliers than we did at Glacial Ridge, um, the wet prairies over here. And what this is showing you is that the spring precipitation had a really strong influence on what species we actually saw when in the field. So that, that's really something we want to start thinking more about is how that influenced these wet prairies, which have some strong outliers. Um, what does that mean for the success of a restoration and the species you get when you have um, more or less precipitation? And again, the age had a significant effect uh, on what was expressed as well. Finally, this, the next one, this, I'm only going to show you two, but this one's important because what we see here is the, the species that were, were collected by combine plus, plus hand collection were much more, um, had much greater richness, species richness than those that were only combined. So we had species richness going this direction, and again, lots more if you added hand-collected seeds. But then when you get out to what was surveyed at Glacial Ridge, um, you have almost complete overlap. So what this difference that we saw with all this richness isn't being reflected so much in what we found later. It's also a bit true for Neil Smith in that we had um, the richness was, was much greater on this end of the spectrum, but here in the middle we saw the combine plus hand was really uh, not that different from what we found throughout in the surveys. Now we've really thought that there might be some differences between dry music and wet prairies. Um, and what, what we found was that that was partly true. At Glacial Ridge, we found um, a greater proportion of native, native species that we observed. And so what was planted was actually observed in the dry prairies compared to the music and wet. We had better collection of species. At Neil Smith, it was across the board um, about 50% of what, we, what was planted was actually observed. So that's um, so it really wasn't that big a difference as much as we had thought it would be. What these graphs are showing you is first um, the proportion of native species that were observed. That's our measure of success again. Looking at the effect of the age of the reconstruction, the number of post seeding burns, and then the planted species richness. This is a correlation. The line is showing the, the correlation. So this one's significant. Some of them are not significant, but they're still in there just so you can see the general trend. So this is Glacial Ridge on top and Neil Smith on the bottom. And Glacial Ridge was still increasing in the number of species that we were observing um, based on age. So there's still hope that, that we're going to see some more, um, some, some more um, species being observed at Glacial Ridge. Neil Smith was very flat. We were seeing about the same amount of species, uh, proportion of species uh, throughout. But it was still, the average was still as high as at Glacial Ridge. So um, it just seems like Neil Smith, the species established more quickly there and stayed about the same. The number of burns, um, that's obviously correlated with the age of the prairie because you can't burn something that hasn't yet been planted, if that makes sense. Um, but we do see a, a strong positive association at um, Glacial Ridge between the number of post-seeding burns and the proportion of planted species that were observed. So that's a good sign that burning is, is having the required, the hoped for effect at Glacial Ridge. Not such a strong effect at Neil Smith, and I can't really, until we can use this apart, we don't, I can't really say why. Um, this is the most discouraging thing, and it, 
ties into what I showed you with the, the non-metric multidimensional scaling, that as we plant more species, we're seeing a smaller proportion of those planted that we're observing in the, the, um, in the surveys. And we would really hope that that would go the opposite direction. So that's, that's a bit discouraging. But what we don't know at this point is how many seeds were planted of each species. And that's a kind of a key piece of information because maybe these um, hand collected species that increased our species richness in the seed mix were not, they were, may have been very sparse. And so our chances of actually finding them, even if they did establish, are probably small. So until we, Without knowing exactly how many seeds per species, it's a bit difficult to make, um, to figure out what that really means. This is looking at the species richness observed, okay, just species richness observed. The open dots are um, in introduced species, the closed are the native species. And we saw different patterns at Glacial Ridge and Neil Smith, increasing, um, species richness at Glacial Ridge of the natives and pretty flat to somewhat declining of um, introduced species. Whereas at Neil Smith, we had a pretty flat of our um, native species and a bit of an increase in the invasive species over time. So that's, that's a difference between, that's a geographic distance difference and we can't really tease out if it's geographic or method at this point. Um, but if we compare that with planted species richness, which we would expect that we would have fewer invasives if we have a greater species richness, we're not finding that at Neil Smith or at um, Glacial Ridge, but we are finding it at Neil Smith. So, so this is a very encouraging thing at Neil Smith um, that in fact as they planted more species that was sort of keeping out some of the invasives. So that was encouraging. This is the last graph, um, looking at mean C, mean coefficient of conservatism, which we expect to increase. What, what it's telling, what mean C is telling us is how, um, how much this reconstruction is compared, how similar it is to a remnant prairie. Like, is it getting that high quality of, of vegetation? So over time at Glacial Ridge, we're seeing an increase in mean C and not at Neil Smith. But mean C was fairly high at Neil Smith to start with, and so it's, it's coming out that it's not that, it's, it's still increasing at Glacial Ridge, so there's hope um, it's not at Neil Smith. So um, the number of post-seeding burns also, now this is encouraging that if you burn, you might be hoping to move that construction, reconstruction forward into uh, something more resembling, resembling a, a, a native remnant prairie. And that it was quite a situation in, at both Glacial Ridge and Nilsen. And the other thing that was, that I showed you earlier about the spring precipitation in the year of planting, um, that was a big driver at Nilsen, and it's, also, it's something we definitely have to take a look at. It did not matter at Glacial Ridge, again, showing that there are differences in, there are geographic differences that we don't understand at this point. So in conclusion, there were some key variables that we couldn't analyze due to lack of independence. And that was where Neil Smith had, um, had one seeding method across a lot of um, different prairie types. Um, it was also seen in that sometimes like the, the drilled seedings, we couldn't really compare drilled and broadcast seedings because they were confounded with, um, with other variables. So I can't go into all of that, but there were, I think when we have a larger database with more input, we have a, a chance to overcome those kinds of collinearity. Um, we had incomplete records, the number of seeds per species in particular, and that's just something that um, it's, it's a hard one. It's very hard when you've got combined seeds, but that's something that we need to work on. And then what actually is a burn? I think we could have had stronger correlations with burn if we had been able to be more precise about, you know, is it 
Does it, was it a totally consuming burn or things like that? And finally, um, the proportion of species planted there that are observed, I think, is a clear metric. Um, even if you just forget about the, the number of seeds, I think it's it's a good metric. I think it's a good one for us to focus on. Mean C was easy to interpret, but not all all sites have a local database, so that's a bit more difficult. But it's clearly interpretable. And geographic breadth can only improve our understanding of reconstruction methodology. And we had funding from the LCC and the SSP and support from the staff at Glacial Ridge and Neil Smith and statistical assistance from Judge Buell. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Um, we have uh, time for some questions, so I'm going to open up the floor to anyone who has questions for Diane. Um, okay, just remember that um, you can find Diane's contact information on our website, uh, either underneath the webinar announcement or on our contacts page. Um, so if you have any questions later on. Um, we can get started with uh, Lisa Schulte Moore. She works for Iowa State and she's going to be talking about her Prairie Strips project. Lisa, are you on the line? I am. I, I did have a question for Diane. Um, oh, go for it. Yeah, I'm just wondering what uh, USGS Fish and Wildlife Service is doing to try to encourage the use of, of common metrics across the, the sites so that it makes, you know, comparisons a bit easier in the future. I think that's part of, of there are two things that are happening, and one is this database that um, that Chicago Botanic and, and Ben Walker and others are putting together, which I think will provide um, guidance and will have a place to put that kind of information in. So it will have, you know, very clear fields to put data in, which will help in the first place. And then we're developing some monitoring protocols that we hope people can use. We've got different levels of difficulty. Um, and different amounts of information you can gather, but hopefully something that each, that anybody with a prairie can use to go out and monitor and put that into the database as well. I had a question as well before we get going, if that's okay. Um, this is Megan Vintage, and I'm on the call here from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And I just had a question when you, Diane, when you were comparing um, the two sites, and the proportion of species that showed up after you planted them, what were the differences in the seed mixes there? Because I, I know you know, but depending on what you plant depends on what you get at the end of it and what you see. So how different were those seed mixes or were they the same between Glacial Ridge and then, you know, the, 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 They were very different. We had higher, we had higher um, species richness at the Glacial Ridge sites, but I don't think that was what was driving the difference because we didn't see a decline when we got to those higher levels. So, I mean, the, the trend was was linear, is what I'm trying to say. So, I the the seed mix is specific to those refuges, though, because of course you want local ecotype seeds, so they aren't completely the same. So, I I guess I don't. There's, at this point, I guess I'm just. I don't know how much of it is geography, how much of it is seed source, um, but there are things that we can get at um, over time with more, with more participation in that database. Great. Do we have any? Do we have any more questions for Diane? Okay, well, Lisa, you can take it away. Okay, thanks, Abby, and thanks, Diane, for your talk. Can uh, you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, and can you see my screen? Um, yes. Okay, great. Well, thanks for everybody for um, coming in today and 
to listen to the webinar. Um, I'm trying to condense everything into a 20 minute, minute presentation is, is always tough. So I decided to talk a little bit about our first experiment on the stretch project and a little bit about the second one and assume that some, that everybody at least has heard a little bit about strips, but provided some background just in case not. Um, and one thing I should point out is even though I get to present to you today, of course the, the strips team is made up of a, a whole bunch of people. Um, these are the, the PIs on the, the top, other investigators that have been involved, and then uh, technicians and, and graduate students and postdocs. Um, Tim Youngquist is our farmer liaison, and he gave a, a webinar last year in the series on, on prairie strips, and so that's why I'm assuming at least many of you know a little bit about the project. And we've been going for 10 years now since our first implementation, um, and longer than that when you consider the pre-work, and that kind of longevity doesn't happen without a, a consortium of, of funders and, and cooperators, and I can't name everybody by name here, um, but here, uh, they, here they are, and they've all been absolutely fundamental to the project, and the LCC has been wonderful in helping us network with potential funding. So our first experiment, the Stress one experiment that we're calling it now, uh, research and demonstration experiment that was conducted or is being conducted on small watersheds at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. And what we've done with the project is we're integrating in strips of prairie into agricultural fields, corn and soybean fields. And the project was really born out of uh, this desire, um, the idea that Iowa and much of the Midwest is a, dominated by agricultural landscapes and will be uh, for a long time to come, hopefully, um, and that that production is important in terms of fueling our whole society, um, both in terms of food as as well as as fuel um, in many cases, and that but that uh, we right now it's coming at a cost in terms of soil uh, degradation, water degradation, and uh, lack of habitat for our, our wildlife, um, and looking for ways that we can try to balance those two outcomes, maintain our food and fuel production, and, and then also improve uh, soil and, and water and habitat for wildlife. The underpinning hypothesis is what we call the strategic integration disproportionate benefits hypothesis, this idea that we're not going to change all the landscape here, but um, you know, if we can be smart about putting perennial or patches of perennials out there on the landscape, that we could get disproportionate benefits in terms of the level of benefit provided per unit area of perennial. And this idea that at that low end of this graph, um, you can achieve the greatest gains, and then at some point the graph asymptotes out a bit um, or attenuates, and as you add more perennials, you don't get as much in terms of, of the marginal gain is, is smaller. Um, and so that's really what we set out to test in our initial experiment, and the design in that experiment at the refuge was, was very well controlled for an ecosystem experiment. We were working on 12 small catchments by small, I mean between one and eight acres in size, and uh, with six to 11 percent slope. And we had four treatments on the left there, a 100 percent row crop treatment, the second one a 90 percent row crop treatment with 10 percent of the area at the at the base of the catchment, that foot slope position in and reconstructed prairie, and then another 10% configuration. But in the, this time, instead of having it all at the foot slope, arranged in multiple strips, and then a 20% prairie with strips configuration. And all of those treatments were replicated three times. And we chose prairie in this case, might be obvious, but uh, I'll go through it just in case, but because prairie is perennial, 
Uh, prairie systems have deep roots, especially in comparison to annuals. You can see the comparison between little blue stem and a new wheat in that image from the Land Institute there on the on the left or on the right. So comparing that perennial species to an annual species, they have stiff stems that stay up in a pounding rain. We think that's important from the the um, uh, slowing down that water, um, taking out some of the power out of it from an erosion standpoint. It's diverse, so it should provide habitat for a lot of species, and it's native. So our native species should be adapted to it. In that experiment, we sowed 33 native perennials, and it's been 10 years of summer well, since we instituted that. Um, in July of 2007 is when the prairie uh, species were sowed. It was a mix of, of uh, prairie seeds that had been combined on Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge, and we added a, a couple more uh, species just to augment the early uh, spring species available to pollinators. And then by 2011, we found 39 species in plant surveys, so either more, these are the native perennials that we want to be there. Um, either those species were expressing themselves from the seed bank or they were in the seed mix and we didn't catch them in the seed analysis or they're coming in from outside the the um, actual treatment areas, we just don't know. But um, by 2011, we feel like we successfully established the prairie. We had 115% cover on average overall. And the intervening areas between the prairie is Corn and soybean, it's managed on that two-year rotation and with no-till soil management. And so that's really the best of the best in terms of soil management and agricultural in an agricultural context. Um, so keep that in mind um, as we look at some of the measures. And speaking of measuring, we were able to do some very in-depth scientific measuring across a range of, of measures including hydrological measures, which are, are not very frequently uh, obtained um, out there in the, in the literature. So those, those data are pretty, pretty special. This past year, we've been working on an integrated analysis across all of the different strips uh, research components, so hydrological, soil, plant, insect, bird components. And um, there's 42 measures that you see here. I don't expect you to sort of look at this in, in detail, but I, I do want you to get the, get the point that we've measured a lot of things in the watersheds. And we've measured more than even what's reflected here. This is just what we could include in an analysis that compared across all four of the the, uh, the measurements were taken on all all four of the treatments, and um, then also they were measured across across multiple years. So we have, for example, information on greenhouse gas emissions, but those were only uh, those measurements were only taken at uh, two of the four treatments and only in a, in one year. Um, the thing I want you to get from this graphic is if we work from the bottom. Um, that comparison, statistical comparison, is between the treatments that have strips versus the prairie all at the bottom. And you can see across measures that there's, there's very few differences. In fact, in this graphic, the only difference is the groundwater orthophosphate. Um, you, there's lower levels of orthophosphate in uh, flowing from the catchments that have the strips as opposed to all of the prairie at the bottom. And um, the phosphorus is a, a, is, a, is a water quality concern. In that middle one, it's comparing the 20% treatment versus the 10% treatment. So does more prairie matter in this context is basically, well, the first one is does where you put the prairie matter? Um, and for the most part, no. And the second one is, does more prairie matter, comparing that 10% to the 20%. And again, across very few metrics do we actually, are we actually, have we teased out a statistical difference? Um, so for example, corn, corn, our soybean crop yield is, is higher 
in the 10% uh, configuration than the 20% configuration. That's probably not surprising. Um, but overall, there's there's very few differences uh, based on the amount of, of query in this particular experiment. And then if you move up to the top, uh, which is the comparison of the catchments that were all crop versus the catchments that had prairie in them, what we see there is a whole bunch of differences. And I'm going to key in next and walk you through what some of those main differences are and how different are they. So in this next graphic, what we see here is, is basically a, um, a multiplicative response on the, on the left-hand axis. And then I'll show you which components these graph these um, these bars represent. But anything that is represented at the dashed line, basically there's no difference if you have prairie or you don't have prairie in the catchment. Anything that's above um, the the bar graph goes above that line. The there's higher levels um, measured with the prairie. And anything below that line, there's lower levels measured with the prairie. So that left-hand graphic or left-hand bar um, on the, is the the big one that is, is soil retention. And so basically, what we've measured is that if you put that little bit of prairie there at the at, in that catchment, we keep 20 times more soil in that environment as opposed to letting it leave out the base of the catchment. So you keep 20 times more soil if you if you have prairie. Um, we have uh, uh, 13 times more native uh, perennial species. Um, and the, that one's not surprising because we, we planted those. The next set of measures have to do with other water quality measures. So we retain about five times more phosphorus in the, in the um, prairie strip configuration. We retain uh, about four times more nitrate, and so less nitrate moving through that subsurface channel. And then also in that surface water, there's less nitrogen leaving the catchments with the prairie strips. And then there's more water infiltration overall so less water leaving those catchments. And then there in the middle, we see more insects, about 3.5 times more insects with the prairie strips and about five times more birds with the prairie strips. We see no difference in the number of weeds in the cropland areas, and we so see no difference in cropland yield either. Um, at, and that's at the per acre level. So there's no competition that we've measured between the prairie strips and the crop fields. And then that last one is the watershed crop yield. So this is this is accounting for the fact that some of the area within the watershed would be placed in a prairie strip prairie strip. And then of course that is lower in the strip configuration than if you would uh, in that all crop configuration. So even though that Right hand bar, you know, it's below below that dashed line and it's below it by about ten percent. Um, it's a it's a small amount. Um, and by trading off that small amount you get all of these other positives with the prairie strips. Um, so that's great. Uh, but I don't want to minimize because it's an important one, especially for the private landowners and, and farmers in this region that need to make money off of their land assets. And right now, they, they can't do that with prairie. So that's our new updated Strips 1 analysis. We are now uh, expanding our work onto commercial farm fields. So in addition to collecting data on the refuge, working on commercial farms to understand um, if we can see similar, do we see similar results when we're working in the commercial farm environment and at an operational scale? And basically what we believe we saw in the first 
STRIPS experiment is that we did see disproportionate benefits with that strategic integration of, of the prairie. And it, at that 10% prairie um, percentage, and we didn't see a lot of measurable gains with that 20% prairie. But now we, in, that, in our new studies, we really want to get a better understanding of what's the range of variation across different um, crop environments uh, in the benefits that associated with about that 10% prairie strip configuration. We started out here at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge. Um, our data were at least uh, convincing to some people because we've been able to expand to working, oops, go back one, working on commercial farms uh, across the state and up and in, down into Missouri, up into Wisconsin. Uh, there should be a few more sites in Wisconsin in this next year, which is exciting. Um, so that gave us the opportunity to study, you know, if we see similar benefits in that commercial environment. When we transition from the refuge to uh, crop fields, you know, people's crop fields, the designs look a little bit different. Here's an example of what our prairie strip design looks like on a crop field just north of Ames here in Wright County, which is on the Des Moines lobe, so it's an undulating topography. Um, you know, straight lines running across a, a hill slope. Here's another example of, of what uh, a design looks like, and this is east of Ames here in uh, much more, much steeper topography in, in Tama County. And you can see that the designs are highly variable. Uh, that's not the only thing that's variable. Um, you know, the, the slopes change, the soils change, the seed mixes change, the you know, everything that Diane was talking about, the methods of seeding uh, changes as you um, are working in this environment. Uh, we're happy that we have farmers and landowners that are willing to work with us. Um, and uh, so we don't make too many requests about how they're, um, you know, when they seed, how they seed, and what they seed. Basically, we can't control for that. And our science the the measure in, in the research that we're doing, what we try to do is make a comparison, a paired comparison between a, a field that has now strict prairie strips and one that is right next to it or nearby that is similar in soil type and slope and crop management but doesn't have prairie strips. It might have other conservation features like grass waterways, like you see in, in this picture, um, but it doesn't have prairie strips. And here's just one example on the Rhodes Farm, just east of Ames here, of, a, of our paired comparison. And you can see that we are working on a much larger scale uh, now. So our control field is 49 acres, and our treatment field is, is 32 acres in this case. And we uh, would love to be able to uh, instrument everything with to the same degree that we did at the refuge, but that's just not financially impossible. We've been able to um, instrument about six sites and uh, collect depth, depth measurements on a range between four and about uh, 14 different sites, depending on which measure you're you're talking about. Um, but we are trying to get some really good data. Um, and here's just a few examples of the data that we're collecting. This is nowhere even close to publishable yet, but I, I did want to give you some kind of indication of the kind of data that we're now getting in STRIPS 2. So here are rainfall and runoff data comparing uh, treatment and control fields at four of the different sites that are, are instrumented with the hydrological um, equipment, the H blooms. and um, so on three of these four sites, we see that there's less runoff with the, with the, on the prairie stress field as opposed to the control field. On that one on the lower right, there's in this one year, um, there's actually more runoff by the end of the year at, at, in the prairie strips field. Um, one year data it just isn't enough. We don't know. We didn't have any pre data on any of these sites, so we don't really understand, you know, the hydro baseline hydrological profile on these sites. So more data are needed, but I did want to give you some sense of of um, the kind of data we're collecting.
Another method we're using trying to look at how much soil is moving, you know, not just weaving the base of the, the catchments, but also how much soil is moving within the fields. And Matt Liebman and Tim Youngquist in agronomy have, are, are piloting this uh, method of measuring soil movement based on erosion pads. And here's what we see just based on one year's, this last year's data, again, at four sites. Um, but you can see here that already we see, you know, these these prairie strips have, you know, in some cases it was they were only um, they were only in the case of White Rock those strips were just in their first year and we're already seeing a treatment effect in terms of the amount of soil movement on the sites with less soil movement. Statistically significant, even though it's one just one year uh, with the prairie strips as opposed to the control fields that don't have the prairie strips. And in terms of some of the wildlife data, um, now that we're working at a bigger scale, we can use some more standard measures of, of looking at uh, bird responses, so using bird point counts so we can get a sense of of um, density in some cases. Uh, we're still working through those analyses, but uh, the, here's some of the count data that we've collected based on uh, uh, two years of observations. And for some species, uh, at least we're seeing more of them with the, with the prairie strips as opposed to uh, without, including species like dixisles and, and meadowlark and common yellowthroat. Um, and, uh, Working out right now, you know, which of these different what what which of these differences is statistically significant. We are also doing some in-depth nest monitoring um, so that uh, uh, we can get a sense of nest productivity. And I'm in my last couple of slides, um, but one of the things that we're trying to uh, provide the information so that people can you know think about okay, there's lots of benefits with prairie strips. You know, how do we get them out onto the landscape, you know, where would you put them on the landscape if you were to um, more widely implement them? And so one of the things we've done in the last year is a geographic analysis where we looked at all of the crop fields in Iowa that are in a, in a row crop that have at least a 10-acre area that is that has a 4 to 10 percent slope. That's kind of, you know, based on our data collection so far and modeling, that's where we think prairie strips are going to be effective in at least controlling soil loss. And you can see the distribution map of fields that meet those criteria in Iowa, and it turns out it's about, about 9 million acres that meet those criteria of a, a crop field um, that has at, that is at least 25 acres in size, I should add that, and has uh, 10 acres at 4 to 10 percent slope. Take home messages, what we're trying to do is hypothesis driven experimental research. Our initial strips one experiment suggests yes, there are disproportionate benefits to integrating in perennials, prairie strips into agricultural landscapes. Um, and we see indication of that in strips two, that they are, are working in that commercial farm and environment too, um, although those data are, are preliminary. So stay tuned. Uh, there's a lot more to come. Great. Um, does anyone have any questions for Lisa? This is Pam Porter. I have a couple questions if there's time. Hi, Pam. You bet. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for the work. Fantastic. Um, I guess the question is, what's the latest? Um, we're, we're hearing some, some things from our law district conservationists and wonder what the latest is on how we answer our strips becoming a trap, trap. crop uh, for pollinators. How do, right. we, how do we best answer that, I guess? Yeah. Um, well, I think that's a, the, it's a question that needs more research. We can't definitively say yes or, or no at this point. Um, we do have, at least in the in the strips experiment context, we we do have some data that are currently under review, and hopefully it will be published soon on 
the transport of neonicotinoids mm -hmm. in in the environment and what we and it's a it's a small amount of data um, but you know it's something that we can use to make the case to to get more um, but what those data show is that when you have prairie strips there's fewer detects of neonicotinoids in the groundwater leaving the catchment. There's fewer detects and lower concentrations of neonics moving in the surface water. Uh, we, don't ten, we don't detect the neonics in the soil or in the plants in, in the prairie strips. Hmm. Um, and so whereas we, you know, we do have more frequent detects and higher levels of detects within the all crop watersheds. Um, so those are, like I said, preliminary results. And, um, and I should also say that th those data were taken after the use of neonicotinoid coated seeds was ceased in our STRIPS-1 experiment, so that there was a gap in time there. Um, okay. But the, the indications are that the, the prairie strips do something <laughs> Uh, in terms of helping to, you know, break down those neonicotinoids, um, you know, we don't know the mechanism yet, um, but it, they don't, we don't see the neonicotinoids at detectable concentrations in the plants, in the prairie strips, you know, a couple years prior to ceasing the use of the coated seeds. So, okay. There's a lot of caveats in there, <laughs> yeah, and there needs to be at this point, right? Um, yeah, that's good. That's helpful. Thank you. You bet. I have a question, Lisa. Um, are there any farm bill sorts of, of advantages for farmers for using the strips, like, like there's payments for CRP, would there be would that apply to any like the strips? So definitely um, farmers can get CRP payments for prairie strips. Um, both of the fields that I showed you in this example, those farmers are getting CRP payments. Um, in, in some cases, um, Sort of the requirements of the, the programs are, are such that not every farmer wants to accept those constraints. Um, and in, in particular, we've had a couple um, processes where a farmer tried to move forward with, with CRP but then um, didn't, didn't feel like his farm was going to be still farmable if he met the, the guide, guidelines of the program. So, there is, you know, there there are CRP can support prairie strips, but you know, and sometimes there's a, a trade-off in terms of farmability. Lisa, do we have a? Uh, I know you're working with NRCS to try to get a conservation standard for prairie strips. Is there any estimate on when you might see that? So we've been working with uh, Iowa NRCS on that. In general, they've They've recommended trying to um, actually establish a standard because of length of time that is required um, to develop that. And in, instead, we're trying to develop documentation to develop, to develop what they call a system approach. Um, so the idea that you know prairie strips would be integrated in into a whole farm uh, conservation system using existing existing standards like the filter strip standard and the and the um, uh, contour buffer st standard and the the wildlife habitat standard got it that that will take less time okay got it yep great questions Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. And again, all of Lisa's, if you didn't get it today, all of Lisa's contact information will be on our website, um, especially when the webinar gets posted next week.
just for our next webinar on Wednesday, March 8th, it's going back to its normal time from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll have Kristen Busca with USGS. She's also the coordinator of the Floodplain Science Network. The Floodplain Science Network, informal community of practice for managers and researchers, researchers interested in floodplains. In her webinar, she will talk how it formed and their future projects. And second, we'll have Paul Charland with the Prairie Reconstruction Initiative. He will talk about what that is, what they're currently doing, and how practitioners can become involved. Uh, thank you so much for joining us with our spring webinar series. Uh, please stay tuned next week, 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Bye.